We're good. Good morning. I love having the big microphone in this, this auditorium. It makes me feel very powerful. <laughs> so um, how are you guys doing? Good? Yeah? All right. So today we're going to talk about effective supervision. Uh, after this session, I'm actually being chauffeured. Very, very fancy. Over to that NAB auditorium for uh, emotional resilience. I don't know if you guys want to go to that one, but, uh, but you're more than welcome to come to it if, if uh, we can make it. So I might be ending this early. I don't think anybody's going to have an issue with that. No? No? Anybody? Anybody devastated? No? Okay, thank you. All right, so, um, so with that being said, we're going to talk about effective supervision. Uh, now, with that, the Keynes, Keynes mission is pretty clear. I literally grabbed this off of your website. The university dedicates itself to the intellectual, cultural, and personal growth of all of its members. As their supervisor, you will teach, guide, and build their skills. And sometimes these skills could be employees, but sometimes these skills could also be the students that you're supervising. How many of you supervise students? Anybody in this room? Okay, so, so you have this, this task to build them. Uh, into the career professionals that they will become. Those of you who are supervising, you know, already seasoned employees, it's to hone their skills, to upgrade their skills. This session will basically teach you a foundation of what's expected in every supervisor at a, at a basic level. So in the center we have uh, supervisory skills. We're going to start with setting expectations, conflict management, communication, professionalism, and leadership. I'm going to give you a high-level overview of each of those topics. And as I go along, um, you know, we, we've, we've, we're not a big group, but big enough. I mean, if you have any questions or any comments that you would like to share, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, especially when I start asking questions, uh, your examples are going to obviously be welcome. So, what are the strategic objectives of your team? Do you know what the strategic objectives are of your team? Any idea? Crickets? That might not be a good thing, huh? Right? Um, and, well, don't feel bad if, if you don't know. Okay? When I ask that question to most teams, most people will know what their overall, like, you know, big lofty goals are. But when it comes to the strategic objectives of their team, very few people have a solid idea of it. A third of employees are unclear about company business goals. This was done by Robert Half International in 2013. And 50% of supervisors don't set clear goals. Um, and if you want the link to the survey, I've given it to you below so you could actually see the data and how it was collected. But, but again, it's not uncommon to hear that people don't know the strategic goals of their team. So how do you know what you're supposed to be achieving? Well, you, you should be setting some expectations. This begins at the start of the project. It could begin at the first day of employment. Uh, it could also begin, it's a, another good time to do this is to do it at the performance review, and it's all, it begins with a process called contracting. Do you know what contracting is? Anybody? Con take a guess. What do you think it is? What? Shout it out. Man, well, yeah, that, that, thank you. Making a contract for what, though? Of what? Of what? Who expects from who, right? Okay. So... Contracting is basically a conversation. You're basically establishing the behaviors that you're expecting from this employee, and, the, and you're also going to establish the behaviors that they should expect from you. You're also going to clearly communicate the expectations of the project. Now, yesterday, uh, in the uh, professionalism session, I mentioned this, and it's worth mentioning to, again for those that were not there. How you set clear expectations is through SMART goals. How many of you remember the SMART goals from yesterday? A couple of you were there. How many of you don't know what the SMART goals, what SMART means? Anybody? How many of you know what it means? Okay, some of you. All right. So let me just go through this really quick. Uh, SMART goals, the S is for specific, the M is for measurable, the A is for attainable, the R is for relevant, the T is for timely. A lot of times people give goals that are way too vague. Like, uh, what was the example that I used yesterday? Improve customer service, was that it? Improve customer service. I see that all the time on performance reviews. How do I know what, what my supervisor expects of me when all they write is improve customer service? Improve team performance. 
Improve team dynamics. I mean, again, I need something more specific. Improve your Microsoft Excel skills. OK, what in Microsoft Excel? All right, so, so again, specific. Let's just take Excel, for, for example. What kind of skills should I be improving in Excel? Maybe I need to improve uh, learning how to insert delete columns, learning how to insert uh, a table, delete a table, amend a table. Be specific. Give me a way to measure my success or my failure. G is, this, is this goal attainable? Is it relevant to what I do? And when do you expect to see this change by? When you're missing an element of this SMART uh, acronym, you're basically leaving out, you're leaving room for, for error. The more that you abide by this, the, the clearer your goal is going to be. And yesterday I did say that there are several places online that you could get these templates. And so I've provided you with the link below, www.smartsheet.com. You have the smart template there. For those of you that are new to making uh, performance reviews, for those of you that are new to supervisory skills, this is a great tool to get you in that mode of thinking so that it just, you know, the, the more that you do it, it's just literally going to come from your mind and come out of your mouth in, in that specific order if you practice it. But again, the word is if, okay, the, obje the objective word. So uh, t take time to be smart. A lot of people don't do this because they think it's, it's uh, a waste of time. I communicate just fine. I'm perfect with my communication skills. But, but again, the errors will show, in the, will show at the result of the project. Take time to be smart. What ends up happening is it's time saving money saving and it actually improves performance and gets things right the first time. I always like to, in projects, avoid what's called a wombat. Do you know what a wombat is? Have you ever heard of that acronym? No? No, it's a good one. It's a waste of money, brains, and time. You like that? So, if, so now in Kane, if somebody starts walking by saying that's a wombat, <laughs> you know, now, now, you, now you know. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, so uh, conflict management. Is conflict normal? What do you think? Yes. Uh, but sometimes, well, let's put it this way. Some people know how to manage conflict. Some people don't. Like, what are the characteristics of a supervisor that knows how to manage conflict? What do they do? They acknowledge the issue. What else? Yes. They listen. What else? What else? They acknowledge the issue. They listen. These are two... Good, good ones. What else? They work to resolve. They provide constructive feedback. They behave professionally. These are all things that, that go with people who manage conflict well. Now let me ask the opposite question. What about people that don't manage conflict well? What do they act like? They avoid. They what? They fly off the handle. Oh my God, we got a bad customer service call. How could you do that? You know, and then you find out that the person just called and said, I, I, I didn't get a phone call back within five minutes. And it's really an issue that's this big, but they made it sound like, like a, a huge mountain. OK, what else? Aggressive. Aggressive. What else? Uh, what? I'm sorry. They take things personally. Yeah, these are all <laughs> not the greatest characteristics to have when managing conflicts. So, but, but conflict is normal. It's normal in every relationship, and it often arises from people who have unmet needs. Maybe it's misinterpreted statements or insults that somebody may have perceived. Uh, conflict is also part, is part of all relationships, and if managed well, it can be healthy. Examples of destructive behaviors, okay, blaming people. How many of you have ever been criticized publicly? How embarrassing is that? It's humiliating, OK? Uh, they, you know, destructive behaviors, when they get emotional, like irrationally, emo like, well, emotions sometimes are irrational. But, but again, they get, they get explosive. Um, or also, if their body language shows that they're, they're extremely upset. So how do you manage conflict? First of all, even if you think that the other person is nuts, you have to realize that conflict is a joint problem. Whenever there's a conflict, you have to see it as your, not only their problem, but also yours. In addition to that, you have to address it in a timely fashion. You cannot tell me. I've had people come up to me after a session like this. Lori, yeah, I've got an employee who's late all the time. Uh-huh. And, you know, how do I address that? 
And I'm like, well, when did they start coming in late? About a year ago. <laughs> About a year ago? When should you have addressed this? A year ago. You should have addressed it a year ago. So, uh, you know, and, and in addition to that, you need to battle the root and not the branches. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, another key thing is to make sure that whenever you're managing conflict, please don't do it in public. Please make sure that you go to some place that's private, okay? And obviously end with a potential solution. So, the first thing we have to do is prepare for conflict. Uh, number one, state the issue. In other words, I don't want to hear about all the drama. I want to hear about the objective evidence. I don't want you to attack the person personally. I want you to attack the behavior. So in other words, calling somebody lazy, is that attacking the person or attacking the behavior? That's the person. Saying that, look, the way that this report was written uh, is really not, not the best work that I've seen. We need to rewrite this report in a better way. That's attacking the, the behavior. Okay, so I, I would rather you prepare for the conflict by thinking about what the conflict is, but also by stating the issue in a way that does not attack the individual. They are probably going to get defensive. How do you handle defensiveness? What do you do when somebody gets defensive? How do you de-escalate the situation? Do you have any tactics? You can acknowledge their feelings or concerns. What else? Okay. And two-way communication on solutions. Hold on. Let's, let's go to the next slide. So let me, let me go back to this really quick. All right. Now, when we're talking about, about managed conflict, when I say battle the root and not the branches, conflict usually ends up in what emotion? What emotion do people commonly feel? Anger. Okay, very quickly, what are the roots of anger? Tell me. Fear. What else? The lack of understanding. Maybe they're scared, maybe they're scared that, 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 that they're not going to understand the issue. What else? What else? People get hurt. That's true. Okay, so... When I started my career as, as, a, as a trainer, okay, a person came up to me and they said, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm a corporate trainer. And they said, really? And I said, yeah. And they were like, but you told me that your parents are Cuban. And I said, what does that mean? And they're like, well, this is just a really weird industry for you to be working in. You should be like in the hospitality industry or something. And I was like, wow, oh no, she did not just say that. And I was like, yes, she just did say that. So what was my initial root emotion? Hurt or fear? Oh, yeah, I was hurt because I was thinking about my mom and my dad working the three jobs to put me through school and all this other stuff. And then a few weeks later, as I let it fester inside of me because I never really addressed it, um, I got what? <laughs> Angry, okay? So here's what I did. About three weeks later, she's like, Lori, you have a business meeting. Or, or Lori, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you about a business meeting that you had to go to. And I, and I like, attacked her for that. Oh, you know, I, I forgot about this voicemail. Oh, I attacked her for that. I was attacking her for all these things. But it's really, these are the branches that I'm attacking her for, okay? I'm not addressing the root. In order for me to get over that anger, I have to address the root of the problem. Does, does that make sense? Okay, because it's, it's kind of like, like uh, when, you, when you plant something in the ground, some of these plants won't, will keep growing. You can cut them off at the top, but they'll keep growing if you don't pull out the... Yeah, you have to. Okay, so when I say battle the root and not the branches, what is the conflict really about? Is this really about the, the, you know, um, the fact that somebody didn't go to lunch with somebody else? Or is there something deeper there? All right? And it might just be as simple as, listen, <laughs> listen, uh, you know, what, asking that question, is this really about this task or is there something else going on here that I need to know about? Is this, is this really about, like, is your lateness really about missing the bus or is there something else that, that I need to know about? Just asking that question can often reveal the root of the problem. Um, when I tell you that, uh, when, when we talk about defensiveness, people will tend to respond in three different ways, okay? When they, get, when they get into a conflict, they're fearful that you're going to hurt them or they're scared, period, 
okay? Or, or sorry, they're hurt or they're fearful, right? Now, typically, you've got three types of responses. You might have people who get passive aggressive. What is passive aggressive very quickly? What is passive aggressive? Give me examples. They hide their feelings. They hide their feelings. Well, they kind of hide their feelings, but they take them out on you. Like, do you, do you know what I mean? Like, uh, so, so what's wrong? What's their answer? Are you okay? I'm fine. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the best one that I ever saw was I was at a shop, right, and the person in front of me, instead of pulling out her wallet, she pulled out a bunch of remote controls. And I asked her, why do you have a million remote controls in your purse? And she says, oh, honey, I got into a fight with my husband, and I took all of these with me and left the house. <laughs> I'm like, you're, you're an absolute genius, okay? But that's passive-aggressive. Passive-aggressive is when somebody, you know, hits you from the side. They don't tell you what's going on, but they hit you from the side. They're sarcastic. They, they withdraw from a situation. They avoid the situation. But they let you know that something's going on through body language or through those, like, non-answers that really are an answer. When you ask them what's wrong, nothing. Okay, what gets resolved there? You have to be able to be on the lookout for that behavior because essentially what they're doing to you, what is that behavior that they're doing to you? What's wrong? Nothing. Are you okay? Uh-huh. What is that? They are lacking communication skills because what are they doing? They're lying. <laughs> okay? Uh, it, it's, it, I'm not going to put a butter coat it. I guess I could. They're fibbing, you know, but they're not telling you the truth. Honesty is a really big thing when it comes to conflict, right? Pass, uh, again, now, now keep in mind that the person who's hearing the information on the other end also has to be emotionally mature enough to handle whatever the person has to throw back, okay? Um, so when I say passive aggressive, those types of behaviors will come out in the conflict. Aggressive behaviors. What are, the, what are aggressive behaviors? Describe that. Once, have you ever been in a conflict and somebody got aggressive with you? Yelling. Yelling. What else? Talking back. Finger. Finger pointing. That is kind of aggressive. I've never had anybody do that. Mm -hmm. You know, what else? <laughs> Hitting the table. That's right. Smacking the table. What else? Defensive... What do you mean I'm not the best worker? You're crazy. You know, yes, I, I understand that. So defensive body language. Um, how about name calling? Blaming. Putting, putting themselves up and the other person down. All right. Uh, those are all behaviors that go with somebody who's, who's in an aggressive state. Um, so when you see these two behaviors come out in a conflict, do they trust you anymore? They basically, they're, there's, no, there's no trust there. They don't feel trust at that moment, all right? You have to redirect their behaviors. How do you re redirect their behaviors? Well, you have to kind of take what they're throwing at you and throw it back at them by redirecting them to what you really mean. And that's a pretty, sim it's a pretty simple exercise. You ready for it? Okay. Basically, you negate what they just said, and then you affirm what you meant. Does that make sense? Okay, here. Um, an employee comes up to you. They want the day off. However, you've already given the day off to two other people. Now the employee comes up to you and says, is this how you congratulate my loyalty? I've been here for 25 years and, and you can't even give me the day off? What are they becoming? They're getting aggressive, okay? Uh, they're starting to attack. They don't... Honestly, going forward in this conversation is, is probably, you know, it's, it's not going to be as productive as you want it to be because they've already put a wall up, right? So here's, here's the verbal judo. I don't want you to think that I don't appreciate your loyalty. Throw back what they just said to you. I do need you to understand that to other people, what? Ask for the day off. Okay, well, I'll just call out. <laughs> Does that happen? Yeah. Listen, I don't, li uh, listen, it, it, it's not my intention to have you behave that way, but I, I need you to understand that 
we need you here on those days. I can, you, uh, you obviously can't prevent them <laughs> from doing that, but, but do you understand what I mean now by redirecting? Let's try another one. Um, <laughs> you go up to, well, let's pretend that you're the employee. You go up to your supervisor and you tell them about something that happened and they call you a drama queen. <laughs> okay? I don't want you to think that, that you know, that, 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 you're dra that, I, you know, that you're a drama queen. I need you to understand that this is, uh, that this is important. I don't want you to think that I'm a drama queen. I need you to understand that this is important to me. Does that make sense? You're basically telling them, look, I need you to stop being scared. I need you to go back to what my original statement was, and I need you to hear it for what it really is, not what you're making it out in your head to be. Um, so, so with that being said, when I said ha say handle defensiveness, that's a way to acknowledge what they've said, but redirect them back to what you meant. Anybody have any questions about that? No? 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 Okay. So communication skills, these are another set of skills that are obviously valuable in, uh, in supervisory um, skills. It's the process of sending or receiving a message, but there are barriers to communication that exist. What are some of the barriers to communication? What are some of the barriers? You're trying to communicate. What are some of the barriers that exist today? What? Background noise, too many emails, what else? Huh? Language. Language, what do you mean? Okay, so lack of English, what else? Eye contact when they don't look at you in the eye, yeah, what else? The body language again, what other barriers exist? They're, they don't want to listen. How about things like temperature, does that become a barrier? Sometimes. What about things like, did the person eat? Did the person go to the bathroom? Did the person get a break today? Those become a barrier to communication as well. So there are many barriers that exist to communication. Um, now, communication in general is made up of mostly nonverbal skills. So body language accounts for about 55% of communication, whereas uh, tone is 38%, and words only compromise about 7%. Okay. So, so in other words, words are about this much, body language is more important, and tone. Obviously, this changes if you're on the phone, but, but it's important to understand those statistics. So let's, let me ask you this question. Is this effective or ineffective communication? Let's pretend that you're talking to an employee, right? There must be a better way to do that. Is that effective or ineffective? Ineffective. Why? What? It's too general. Yeah. You, as a supervisor, you have to be careful. You know. Now, now here's the reality: you can never predict how somebody's going to interpret something, right? At the end of the day, they are going to 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 take that message and make it whatever they want to make it in their heads. But there are ways that you can limit that that possibility. Saying something, there must be a better way to do that. What's a better way of saying that? What's a better way of saying that? Is there, Is there a better way to do that? That's a good one. What else? What else? Have you ever thought about other ways of doing that? Okay, asking the questions is honestly a better way than just state making that statement. You know, you've been here for such a long time. Why don't you know how to do this already? Have you ever had someone say that to you? First of all, what does that make you feel like? You're like, boop, down here, right? Um, you've been here for such a long time, why don't you know how to do this? What's a better way of saying stuff like that? Have you run across this before? That's really, really, you're good at this. What else? There, there is a, a uh, there's a technique called the pause the sandwich of positive. Have you ever heard of this? You start off with a positive, you give the criticism, and then you end with a positive. Have you ever heard of this? Okay, I value, I value your expertise. I know you've been here for a long time. Uh, I saw this report come in, okay, and I see that there's some errors in it. Uh, why don't we work together in improving this? 
okay? Or let me know what, what's going on that, that, where we can improve this. Much better than, hey, you've been here for a long time. Why don't you know how to do this already? <laughs> All right? Um, oh God, you know, you're making my job harder. Uh, again, when you're saying stuff like that, are you totally unreliable? Those are things that will literally take away from that person's self-esteem, and they will take away from their performance, and quite honestly, it messes with their head. Uh, you know, once, once they come in with, with that perspective that they're being spoken to like that, their, their performance does suffer. So making statements where, you, again, you're criticizing the person is not effective. Um, when we're talking about effective communication, again, we, we talked about body language. What kind of body language do we want to show? Open body language. But let me, let me, let me go back up for a minute. Your office. <laughs> Does your office say something about you as a supervisor? What do you think? Do you have an office, first of all? <laughs> Some of you yes, some of you no. Okay, uh, but does, your, does an office environment say something about, about the culture? Yeah, okay. Let's pretend that you've got an office where you've got that flip, flip table, you know, the, that opens up, and those steel chairs. Do you know what I'm talking about? Those, the, okay. What does that tell you? Or what about an office that has those comfy chairs and the nice tissues in the middle of the table? Uh, I mean, like, I, I, again, it says something. I once went into a manager's office where he had uh, quotes from Attila the Hun everywhere. <laughs> and, I mean, like, it was like, you know, rip somebody apart, something or whatever. I mean, I, and, and to this very day, whenever I would walk in there, what, what was my feeling? <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I'm going to get killed, right? I wanted to leave. Um, and then I went into another manager's office who, who I think she was like a yogi, a, a yoga person, and she had like the Zen office that every single time I walked in there, I felt sedated. Have you ever, do, do, do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, let me put bamboo, I'm going to paint the wall green. Let's put, you know, Yanni in the background and all this other stuff. And you will walk in there and she could be firing you. And you'd be like, it's okay. <laughs> I'm fine. Uh, it, it, listen, in, in March of, I think, 2017, Harvard Business Review did, uh, this is not a, a formal part of this, but they, they actually um, did a whole piece on this. Uh, so I think it's March, January, January, just look January through March 2017. Uh, Harvard Business Review, uh, the emotional culture of a workplace. And they actually studied what the physical environment of a workplace transmits. So much so that um, they, they did studies where they have an app to, to uh, record the employee's emotions throughout the day. <laughs> right? And so, in other words, you would go on the app and you would record what you felt like when you came into work and what you felt like when you left work. <laughs> And they, would, they, they got the results of this, and they found that a lot of people were actually kind of depressed um, or, or in anxiety by the time that their work day ended. And as a result, they changed the emotional environment. And when I say the emotional environment, the way that they behaved, but not only that, the way that the office appeared. Um, so, so when I say, uh, you know, again, look at your office environment. Is it cheery? Is it welcoming? Can, do you allow, I mean, does Kane allow for pictures of your family to be on the desks and all that other stuff? Yes? Some places don't, okay? Um, what, how can you make it more inviting, more of a culture that, that supports um, emotional well-being? Uh, the body language, again, it's a big deal. When you walk in, uh, and I stated this yesterday, if you're walking in like this, oh God, you know, my, my life sucks. You know, here I am, another day, another dollar. <laughs> you know, I'm just going through the motions until I retire, yep. <laughs> Been here for 35 years, yeah, yep. I mean, like, again, does that transmit to your employees? And yesterday I talked about the emotional contagion effect, and I hate to tell you that if you're a supervisor, you're actually the most contagious out of the whole team. So whatever you come in with, you, you tend to give off to three degrees out. This is, again, very well researched. You could go on, you know, your Google Scholar or whatever and type in emotional contagion leadership, and you will see that that 
uh, whatever mood you come in with, you tend to transmit it off to three people. It's kind of scary, right? Um, so, effective communication means acknowledging what the person is doing or saying, right? So when they come into the office, if they want to speak to you, it's one thing, like again, look at your office environment. Oh, you know, I, I'm, oh, you're always welcome to come speak to me, but your door is always closed. Oh, you're always welcome to come speak to me, but I have piles of stuff on each of the chairs <laughs> that are in my office. Okay. Um, again, look at your office. Igno when I say acknowledgement, I mean, I mean keep that door open. Make sure that there's space for the person to sit down. Make sure that, uh, that when you have a chance, look at them <laughs> when they're speaking to you. A lot of us like to multitask. Like, have you been to the doctor lately? Have you been to the, I, I, I ask this because it's actually um, a, a kind of like a well-known um, I don't know what, I don't want to say phenomena, but it's something along those lines that people who are in the teaching professions, they tend to take care of everybody else but themselves. <laughs> so, so when I ask, have you been to the doctor lately? I, I wouldn't be surprised if most of you are like, no, I haven't been to one in years. Uh, so, so, uh, when, have you, have you gone to one lately? Have you seen, how, what is your doctor's bedside manner with you? Do they look at you? What do they do? They're typing? or they're writing, okay? And some of them even have their backs turned to you as you're speaking to them. Think about that as an employee coming in to speak with you. When I say acknowledgement, wouldn't it be nice if that doctor did what? Just, what they're sitting in that chair typing away, well, what would be nice? Turn around, look at them, okay? Uh, or even just say, uh, uh, I, I just want to make sure that I am listening to you. The reason why I'm typing is I'm, I, I'm writing what you are saying down. And giving that acknowledgement to the person so that they know that you are actually there, that you're not just distracted by something else. Uh, make sure that you paraphrase everything that the person says. When I say, um, the, what was one that I had last week? I had a harassment case where somebody said something rude to one of the female waiters at a restaurant, and that female waiter went and slapped the guy across the face. <laughs> she slapped him across the face so hard that he had the welt, like the, like the literal hand mark. I forget what movie that's from, but yeah, she had, there was a hand mark on this guy's face because she hit him so hard, all right? So, of course, we have to do this investigation. I go in, and I start asking these questions, and everything that she said, well, he said something rude to me. I'm not going to tell you what he said, though. All right, well, he said something rude to me. Okay, so what you're telling me is that he said something rude to you. Is this what he said? Yes, that is what he said. And I wait for her to confirm that, yes, that's exactly correct in how I interpreted it. Uh, do I interrupt her as she's telling me her story? <laughs> no as I'm going to fall over here. Uh, do I make eye contact with her as she's telling me her story? Of course I am. These are things that tell people that you are listening. Um, how do you increase self-esteem? Like what kind of things? Okay, now let's get to the nice positive stuff. How do you increase the self-esteem of your employees? Because you have to pay attention to the positivity as well. What do you do for them? It's as simple as saying what? Thank you. What else could you do? What else do you do? To increase self-esteem of employees. Yes. Positive huh? Positive, positive feedback. Supporting a solution. Okay. How about cute things? Yes. Empowering them. Huh? Empowering them. And trying to empower them. All right. When I say when I say celebrate a job well done. Okay, some people will say good job, some people will say thank you, some people will throw a party, some people will, some people will literally, I'm not kidding, get greeting cards and literally leave them on people's desks. I know it sounds silly, but those are the types of little things that people really hold on to. Um, I have a, a supervisor over at Summit Medical Group that whenever somebody's having a bad day, she has a bag of, I'm not even kidding, Hershey Kisses and she leaves it on their desk to give them kisses and hugs throughout the day. I know it sounds corny, but it's super cute. Um, this, it could be sexual harassment if you think about it, but... <laughs> <laughs>
But, but that, you know, little things like that, little things like that, having fun at work, doing fun things, giving a positive quote at the start of the day. Uh, there, there's a million things that you could do to, to celebrate a job well done. Write things down. If you see that somebody is not right or if they're showing emotion on their face, call out the emotion. Hey, listen, you know, are, uh, is everything all right today? Uh, and if they tell you, I'm fine, you know, uh, okay. But, but just make sure that you're noticing emotions on people. Remembering key moments. Like, what are some key moments that you should be remembering of your employees? You can't just take care of them performance-wise, is what I'm trying to tell you. You have to take care of them as a whole person. When I say key moments, what are some big things? Birthdays. Birthdays. Oh, yeah, that's a big one. What else? Work anniversaries is another big one. What if they're going through something? Do you, do you celebrate an environment of mutual support? What that means is that, again, if we go to the military, you'll see that they have what's known as, as task assistance and mutual support. What that means is that if you're going through a life crisis, what are the life crises? What are they? Divorce. Marriage is also a life crisis, if you think about it. What else? Bir birth of a child or adoption. What else? Illness. Financial. Health. What else? What, what? Death, dying. Okay, the death is dying. Never mind. Okay, what else? Um, uh, job change. These are, major, these are major changes in a person's life. Okay, during those times, are you 100% there? Some people can be, but trust me, uh, other people might need somebody to back them up. Now, if it's an everyday issue, okay, where, where their performance is not up to par every single day, that's a performance issue. But if they're going through something, telling people that, listen, you know, we, we have an environment here of mutual support, of task assistance. What that means is that if you're going through something, you would come up to me and I'm going to try to support you with, with people to come and help you if you, need, if you need help throughout the day. Because if their head is not completely there, think about it, think about what it means for reaching your goals. What could happen? Error. Okay? Failure of the project, failure of the goal, whatever. By doing that, not only do you take care of the person, but you're also taking care of your overall goal. Uh, spending time with them to train them or getting them to, to training such as this one. Sharing compliments that people give. We have this really bad tendency of sharing negativity. How often do you share compliments? Do you share compliments? Do uh, a lot of companies, what they do is that it, they have this, um, like, like what are some of the carrier clinic, the star awards, uh, you know, uh, some medical group does this thing like I, I, I saw you do something or whatever and they write a note. So in other words, the employee sees the other employee doing something and they take the time just to write a quick little blurb and the supervisor delivers it to them. Do you do stuff like that here? These are just quick suggestions that I know might, might, not be for everyone, but that are for a lot of companies and do create uh, positive work environments and employee engagement. Um, follow through with your commitments. If you tell them that you're going to help them with a project or, you're telling, or, you, or you tell them that you're going to get them a laptop or you tell them that you're going to do something, guess what? <laughs> what should you be doing? Do it. Okay. Um, smile. And a big thing is admit when you're wrong. All right. Yesterday I talked about humility. Uh, the last PDD I also did a whole session on humility. Uh, one of the strongest leadership traits that a leader, that a good leader has is the ability to know what their weaknesses are and the ability to know what their strengths are and the ability to say it out loud. Okay? When you do that, you create an environment of what's known as vulnerability-based trust. Have you ever heard of that? There's predictive trust and then there's what's called vulnerability-based trust. Predictive trust is that trust that I develop with you when I know that you're going to come in on time. It's the trust that I develop with you when I know that you're going to get the job done. But vulnerability-based trust is a different type of trust. What is that? What is it? What is vulnerability-based trust? Hmm? So you're letting the person know that you're human. So in other words, what are you able to say to your supervisor? Oh, here. Is there vulnerability-based trust in your team? Are you able, are you able to go up to your supervisor and say, hey, supervisor, I made a mistake without getting killed for it? You don't have to answer it, don't worry, okay? <laughs> are you able to say, look, this is not my strong point. Can I get some help with this? 
Are you able to say, oh man, I goofed up? <laughs> all right. If, if you are able to say all of those things, you have vulnerability-based trust. This is a concept that was made very famous by, by uh, Patrick Lencioni. Do you know who he is? He's the guy who wrote the book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Have you ever heard of that book? Yeah? No? Okay. Uh, again, when we're talking about Patrick Lencioni, he did say that, that um, vulnerability-based trust, what it tends to do is it tends to transform a team because people are able to be themselves. They're be able to go to you when something is wrong. They're able to admit their wrongs. They're able to admit their rights. And it transforms the team into something stronger because they're not constantly on edge about disappointing you. <laughs> okay? Um, uh, again, a resource that you could do uh, that you could look for is, again, that book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, or you could look up that concept, vulnerability-based trust, on the internet, and you'll find tons about it. Um, so, listening skills, again, active listening is a big one. Um, again, removing barriers to listening. What, what active listening is, very quickly, is making sure that you're looking at the person, making sure that you're acknowledging the person, making sure that you're limiting that noise, making sure that the, the office is a good temperature, making sure that people got their, their breaks, that they got their, their luncheon, that they were able to go to the bathroom today. I know it sounds silly, but a lot of people don't do that. <laughs> okay. Um, so trying to remove as many barriers to listening as possible, responding and paraphrasing, but also asking clarifying questions. I'm breezing through this because we kind of already covered it. Um, but also acknowledging what might not be said. What I mean by that is that, again, acknowledge the emotions that you're seeing in your employees. Um, yesterday we also talked about, uh, you know, what, when people say something to you, making sure that you're training people to see what was really said versus what they interpreted. I'm going to take that concept a step further right now. Okay? So on your papers, I want you to draw a circle. Okay? A lot of the times that people will come up to you with issues, they sometimes are interpersonal issues, okay, with, with other employees. A lot of the times it's drama that they've created in their head. One of the things that you could do is on in the first circle, you write down the words what is said or what was done. Okay, so in the first circle, you write down what is said or what was done. You draw another circle next to it, and then you write down the, 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 the interpretation that they've made of it. And you literally do this for them. You make them do this activity. Okay, the example that I used yesterday was, what was it? You have to be smart to be a supervisor, right? Somebody comes up to you and says, Lori, you want, I want to be a supervisor. You turn around and you say, you have to be smart to be a supervisor. Right? Not the best choice of words, correct? So what you said, what was said to the employee was, you have to be smart to be a supervisor. What was their interpretation? You're not smart. Now they come up to you saying, oh, well, this person said I wasn't smart. This person said I was stupid. That's based on interpretation. Okay, let's write this down. What the person said what the interpretation is that you made of it. What else could that person have met? Let's go back to that first circle. Give me other interpretations. Okay, because here's the reality. You're, you're, you, what was it? You have to be smart to be a supervisor? It could mean you have to work hard. You have, you, could, you have to go to school longer. You have to stay in the job for a longer period of time. Maybe you're smart. Maybe you're stupid. There's a million different things that you could, you could interpret from that. But have them come up. Coach them to see other interpretations. Does that make sense? Because here, with their one initial interpretation, they've come up with what their ego has told them. Okay? When you train them to see the other interpretations, you're actually bringing them back to what the reality could be, because about 80% of the time, their ego is wrong with the interpretation. So, so try to bring them back to the original, to the possible original meaning of the statement. So, um, again, it, when people run off with their interpretations, it causes negative repercussions to the relationship. You want to make sure that you train them with, with little tools like that. Um, your attitude can make the difference between success or failure. Um, again, when we talk about Disney concepts, let me go through this really quick. It, are, you, are, are you a person that says, I love Disney, I'm one of those mouse-obsessed people? B, Disney is the evil empire. C, why would I go to an imaginary land when there is so much in the real world that I can see? Or D, Disney rocks Hakuna Matata. Which one are you? Okay. Uh, well, 
very quickly, Disney, again, is, is one of the things that I'm going to keep bringing up. And, and it's because they have this concept called Everything Speaks. What that means is that everything, from the way that you behave, to the way that your office looks, to the way that people dress, to the way that you write your emails, will speak volumes of your leadership. You want to transmit that to your team. You, want to make, uh, you definitely want to make sure that they understand this concept that I've been relaying, and I'm going to keep relaying. Uh, in addition to that, they should understand that they are cast members, just like, just like at Disney. I know it sounds like a foreign concept, but you're here, to, and you, when you're here, you have to have a workplace persona. Okay? We all go through horrible things, but when we are at work, we need to put our best face on um, and, and put on a show for people. So what role do you play? What kind of show do you deliver when you're on stage? As a leader, when I say manage the environment, make sure that you're managing a positive environment, free of bullying, free of, of harassment. Again, I don't, I, I've, I've been to work environments where people are saying whatever they want to say about people, uh, picking on them for whatever reason. And, and just like in a schoolyard, you have to manage the environment in, in a positive way. Manage change. When change happens, are you a positive change agent or are you a negative change agent? Like, let's pretend, let's pretend we're going to war, right? And there's the opposing team on the other side, right? And your soldier comes up to you. <laughs> you're, you're clearly outnumbered. Your soldier comes up to you. You're the general, right? And the soldier comes up to you. Hey, man, what's going to go on over here? What do you think? What are our chances? A negative change agent acts like this. Oh, dude, we're totally, you know, we're totally goners. <laughs> this is going to be horrible, OK? Positive change agents, what they do is that they say, listen, Everything, I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring, okay, but we're going to do our best. We're going to get through this. Let's go, all right? Whenever change happens, you have some managers who will run out and create anxiety amongst the ranks by saying, oh, this is horrible. This is going to be horrible. What does that do to the rest of the team? All right? As managers, we don't have to tell them everything that's going on. All right. However, we, you could still be truthful, but, but and still be positive. Listen, I don't know what to, I don't know all the details. I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring, but <laughs> we're going to get through this. We're going to get through this project. We're going to get through this. Being a positive change agent is not only good for the team and their performance, but also good for their emotions. Um, also, when I say managing negativity, like I said, negativity is toxic sometimes to a work environment. It's not always if you know how to work through it. That's what the next session is about. Um, but when I say managing negativity, I don't, I don't mean that you, you come in with this, hey, everybody be positive all the time. Come in with your, like, sunshine and be bubbly and all that stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. When I say manage negativity, what I'm talking about is coming in with whatever the positive attitude is for the moment. If you're going through a hard change where, I don't know, somebody, uh, you're, you're transitioning to a new system and people are getting nervous, you might want to come in with a positive attitude of resilience. If you have people who are not confident, you might want to come in with a positive attitude of instilling confidence in them. That's what I mean by managing negativity. By that, you will manage emotions, especially during a time of change. The emotions that are going to come up are negative. Don't try to tell everybody, hey, be strong. <laughs> We're going to get through this, right? Not, uh, what, I, what I mean by managing emotions is also saying, listen, these emotions that you're feeling are normal. But we are going to get through it. And whenever you need to work through it, uh, it's, it's fine to come to talk to me about it. Make sure that you're doing this in a realistic and positive manager, man, manner and realize that the emotional contagion effect will take place. Um, the last concept that I want to talk about is known as servant leadership. How many of you have heard of this? Few people. Okay. There's another book about this. If you want to go pick it up, it's called Servant Leadership. I forgot who wrote it. I want to say his name is Greenleaf. I want to say, yes? Okay. Um, Servant leadership is another leadership model. There's tons of them. But it, it kind of functions on the art of reciprocation. Uh, like, like <laughs> if you go to Costco on a Saturday, like the Costco in Union on 22, what is that like on a Saturday? Huh? <laughs> yeah, it's a nightmare. All right? And, and part of the, and, and did, did I ever tell you this story that I took my Spanish cousins, my, my cousins from Spain to Costco for an American experience? Did I ever tell you this? No? Okay. My cousin Javier, he's like, Lori, 
I'm like, yes. He's like, I want to know the American experience 100%. And I, he's like, where are you going to take me? The Statue of Liberty? I'm like, no, I'm going to take you to Costco. And he's like, what? What is Costco? And he's like, so I drive up, and I pull up to the parking lot at the Union one, and he's like, why does anybody need a cart this big? <laughs> I'm like, you're in America. This is why you need a cart this big. Right? So, I, so I take him to the back. He's like, he's like, okay, so what are you showing me? And I'm like, see those ladies with the little things on their head? He's like, yeah. He's like, they're giving out free samples. Free samples of what? Food. And see that lady in the crutches over there? <laughs> I was like, she's waiting for that free sample. He's like, okay. I was like, watch what happens as soon as that free sample is ready, right? So all of a sudden, ding, the microwave goes off, and everybody almost pummels over the lady on the crutches <laughs> to, get, to get the free sample of pizza. And I was like, welcome to America. <laughs> and he was like, what? I was like, yeah, come on. You got you to fight. You got to get through, the, through everything, get to the top, and, you know, whatever. This is... This is, this is Perfect cultural example right here. He's like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, but why does Costco do that? I don't know why I told you that story. I guess it's a good segue. <laughs> but why does Costco do that? Why do they give out those free samples? Because obviously what? If I give you something free, then you're, you're more likely to buy it. It's reciprocation. Every culture on the planet is trained in the law of reciprocation. What that means is that uh, if I do something for you, I increase my chances, God knows how much, but of you doing something for me, right? Now, a lot of managers go in with that mindset. Oh, you know what, I'm going I'm, I'm to get, I'm gonna get, they're going to go in with this mindset of let me get something from them. Let me get performance from them. The servant leader and also the, 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 the leader that uses that reciprocal model doesn't go in with, what am I going to get from them? What do they do? It's the opposite. What do they do? What do I need to do? What can I do for you? Once they come in with that, the other person tr tends to come in with, okay, now I kind of owe them, <laughs> right? It doesn't always work, but, but you have a higher chance of it happening. The, le the servant leader is servant first. It begins with a natural feeling that one wants to serve, to serve first. Then conscious choice brings one to aspire to lead. That person is sharply different from the one who is leader first. Okay? There's a reason why people who are trained in the military, I, got, I, I forgot what the percentage is. Like, I think it's a, about 40 to 50% of CEOs had military experience. All right? Why? Because in the military, you're trained that what comes first? The mission, the team, or the leader? Which one? The mission. Then? The team. Then? The leader. Uh, in, a, in a lot of places, leadership doesn't function that way. <laughs> in fact, what do they do with that model? They flip it on its head. The leader comes first, then the team, then the mission. The servant follows that military model. What's our mission? How do I take care of my team? And how do I take care of myself as a result? Um, so it's a style of leadership that's based on listening. Self-awareness, being mindful of how you're feeling, the intention to understand each individual as an individual, understanding that each employee has their own unique formula of stress and understanding what stresses this person out, uh, really learning the person. And I know it sounds like it's time-consuming, but it's really not that time-consuming. If you just sit there and coach them for 15 minutes, you know, uh, initially you might want to coach them for half an hour, but doing 10-minute coaching sessions continuously you will be able to, uh, to, to build that self-awareness and understand each individual. Nurture and create paths for higher goals. Nine times out of ten, the job that they're in now is not their end goal. What is their end goal? Let's just be honest about it. And how can I help you get there? All right, what are you doing now that could help you get there? And they're committed to serve others. And again, there's humility. All right, so, oops. So when I say servant leadership, um, Th uh, it, it, go back, find out what makes those employees tick. What do they love? What is their best day at work? What is their worst day at work? All right, these are two really big questions to ask them. Um, that, that, that actually comes from Marcus Buckingham. Do you know who he is? He's one of the people who did the Gallup poll. All right, what is the best day that this person has had at work? 
in the last three months? What is the worst day that this person has had at work in the last three months? Those two questions will tell you what they excel at and what they might not like to do. That doesn't mean that you don't put them in the roles that they don't like, but it might tell you where you might want to put them more. Um, he also did this questionnaire also called the Q12. Are you familiar with that? Q12? Ooh, okay. All right, do me a favor. When you go back to your office, go on the internet, type in Q12, Gallup, okay? It's, it's a very simple questionnaire, five-point scale, and basically it, it tells you how well your team is performing and what they think of you. Now, mind you, I'm going to do a disclaimer. Please be emotionally prepared when you get the results of this, because if you are going to have a mental breakdown, I do not suggest that you look up the Q12. Please leave it to the side until you get some emotional, <laughs> emotional support, because questions one through six of that Q12, the reason why it's called Q12 is because there's 12 questions, or well, I don't know why I put up two, but 12 questions, all right? Questions one through six are indicative of how you perform as a manager. Now, the great thing about the Q12 is it's, it, it, you can change it. Based on those scores that you get, with five being the highest in each of those areas, you can improve upon them and then obviously increase the, the well-being of your team. But it will be an indicator of how well you lead. Because here's what, what uh, people have come to find out. People don't leave companies, right? Have you ever heard of this, this quote? Who do they leave? The people leave managers. All right. Um, so if you're ready for something like that, I definitely recommend it. Uh, that, will, that will definitely bring you the self-awareness that you might need. Because as you get higher in the chain of leadership, the less feedback you get about your leadership style because you're responsible for people's paychecks. So it's, it's, uh, it's like my... my, my uh, I guess you could call him my father-in-law. He would say to me, he's like, you know, now that I'm the chief, I'm the chief. Nobody tells me anything about how I must be doing so much better because nobody says anything to me anymore. I'm not like, dude, you're, you, I was like, I'm, thinking, I'm looking at him and I'm like, wow, you, you want to know why nobody says anything to you anymore? It's because you're the chief. You're the chief. You can fire them. All right. If you want people to tell you the truth about you, literally give one of those things out, have them fill it out anonymously, get the results back, and then have a good, hard, honest look about yourself. Um, so, so again, servant leadership, Q12 for self-awareness. When I say intention to understand each individual, literally do, go, send them to the personality styles classes. Go with them to the personality styles classes that they offer here. Um, make sure that you're, you, you understand what they like, what they don't like. If you want to read the article by Marcus Buckingham, it's another Harvard Business Review article called What Great Managers Do. So again, you can look up what great managers do, Marcus Buckingham, and you will see that those two questions are extremely important to find out why, why, uh, how to understand each individual. Again, through those questions, you can nurture and create those paths to higher goals. So with that being said, in conclusion, this session gave you a, a lot of tools. They're, over, they're, they're big, broad views of things. We could go into each of these sections very deeply, but what my intention was was to introduce you to some key concepts, give you resources so then that you could go and do your own exploration. Research it, apply it, wa and watch your team respond. Sometimes some of the things that I've mentioned here are not the, the uh, correct formula for your exact team. Maybe they don't respond to servant leadership. They might respond to another type of leadership. Okay. Uh, but share also your experiences with your colleagues because here's the thing, a lot of you will gain the best knowledge from each other because you know exactly what you do. All right? It's great to go to a seminar, but make sure that you're sharing the experiences that you, that you have at the university with colleagues who do similar job functions. Okay, so with that being said, do you have any questions? 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 No? Yes? Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Does anybody else have any questions? Do you have any needs, like as far as for me to repeat the resources? Yes? yes. How do you deal with two staff members who are just not getting along and have conflicts between them um, and come to you for a solution? Try getting them in and just escalate between them and like how do you deal with things that are outside of work performance but obviously the work environment? 
Okay, so let me make sure I understood you correctly. You've got two people who don't get along. They come up to you to be the mediator. Okay. Um, have they ever tried to talk to each other without you? Um, they can't speak to each other without getting echoed. Okay. That's difficult. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, so here's the first thing that I usually recommend. Whenever, there, whenever an employee comes up to you, and says, listen, so-and-so is being mean to me. Can you intervene? All right. If you go in to intervene and you don't promote the employee to go, and, uh, and again, aside from harassment issues, if it's a harassment issue, intervene. Okay. But, but if it's an interpersonal issue that they could solve, promoting that the employees speak to each other keeps the trust within that team. Once you as a supervisor get involved with resolving it, um, especially if it, the, the other person is getting blindsided, trust then fades away. Right? So, so my first thing is, is try to get employees to talk to each other without you. Okay? You could give them mentorship, um, but try to get them to talk. Now, if it keeps escalating, uh, you know, and, and you've, tried, you've tried talking to them how many times? Or having these mediation things, how many times? Twice. Twice. Okay. Are you coming up with goals at the end? Are they just venting, or do they come up with goals and solutions? Yeah. Well, and you have to affirm that we're here to work. We, you know, we all want to do a good job. We all want to make sure that we please our bosses. We all want to go home to our families. Let's just make sure that our work environment is civil. Make sure that you are giving each other the work that you need. But please, I mean, again, um, try to limit the negativity. Now, if they're not able to do that, uh, again, and if it keeps going, this might now become something where you get. HR involved, and uh, HR might actually get EAP involved, um, and it, it'll go from there. Uh, unfortunately, if if one person's willing to sync with the other person, but the other person doesn't want to, it's it's a tough situation to be in. It sounds like you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Yes. They, it would be for all managers, yeah, HR is. I could tell you they're actively working on that. Perfect. Yes, okay. they they've already they they've already seen the need for it, and they've actively engaged me in getting this. You're act. You're the first. You're you're like my guinea pig class for this one. Okay, just so you know, that's why it's a little choppy because you're you're literally the first team of people that have have seen this presentation. Yes. Remember how you made them feel. Yeah. 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 No, I, I, I agree. Listen, I mean, like, if you've never had a supervisory class before, uh, and everybody needs to get on the same page. And the only way that you're going to do that is training them in the same content. All right. So, yes. <laughs> Chronic negativity? Send them to the next class. <laughs> That's what you're supposed to do. Send them to the next class. Um, you know, some people, like, negativity is not a bad thing, okay? Let me, let me be clear about that. I'm not mispositive. Like, hey, be positive all the time. No, negativity actually tunes you into what your values are. Um, and, and if you know how to use it, it can become something very productive. Now, if all you do is what's called perseveration or rumination, constantly dwelling in it, they could have some really bad health effects on you mentally as well as physically. Um, so that's why I say, you know, again, sending them to classes on emotional resilience. I mean, sometimes they just can't hear it from you. Oh, how do you approach it? Write down examples. 
Well, write down examples, objective examples of exactly what they said or how they responded. Not your interpretation, objective examples. And again, you have to also assess, is this person emotionally okay to handle stuff like that if you're going to be blunt about it? Okay, um, I would develop a relationship to let them know that you come from a place of helpfulness, not a place of hurt, okay? And I would literally tell them, like, listen, I know that you're trying your best, and I know that you're, 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 you, you're, good, you're, you're a very good asset to this team. However, I do see the, this behavior, this behavior, this behavior, and, and maybe, it, you know, maybe there's another way of approaching that. Um, again, that, that question is has many layers to it, <laughs> okay? Um, I, I think probably the best thing to do to answer your question is, yes, what I just told you is a really quick synopsis of what I would do, but uh, I'll give you my email and we could go back and forth on it. I could coach you on it, okay? Anybody else? Yes? So I've read a few articles on conference gossip. Uh-huh. And we're in a pretty transformational environment here. So at what point I mean, office gossip exists everywhere. But if they're talking about, like, like if they're talking about people's private lives, if they're talking about people's, like, if it, if it's any, like, look, private lives, sexual. If it's any of the protected categories, if it's any, you know, and when I say protective categories, I, I'm talking about race, religion, sex, gender, or gender, sexual identity. Um, you know, orientation, all of those things, uh, that's where you have to do a hard <laughs> no, okay? Um, office gossip can be toxic if it gets into those areas, um, number one. Number two, if it starts getting into the area of bullying, again, that's, that has to be a little bit of a hard no, too. Um, but if it's like, you know, silly office gossip um, of, you know, what do you think's going to happen and what do you think's going to happen here, I would just literally say, listen, guys, I know it's it's fun to speculate about this stuff, but let's just try to stay positive. That type of stuff you could kind of be a little easier with. However, hard nose on the other two. <laughs> okay? Any, any other questions? All right. I've got to run over across the campus now. Thank you very much. If you want copies of this, they will be posted online. Uh, so saith HR. Okay? <laughs> so thank you very much.